Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Parasim. And we've got video today? What is this? <laughs> we have video and like a whole bunch of content. Like we've been kind of scraping for some episodes, but how much stuff do we have today? Um, let's see. Well, I played Scribble Knots Unlimited. Uh, I also saw Star Trek Into Darkness and Iron Man 3. So that's me. I, I don't know about you that guys. Sen has played Iron Man 3. Seen. Or seen Iron Man 3. I have seen both of those movies and have been playing Far Cry 3. I know it's a little behind the curve, but uh, still really entertaining. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, Scribble Knots Unlimited is not very new either, Sen. I'm not sure if you're aware. The reason you can't see Sen is because lack of he camera. He refuses to buy a camera. <laughs> So that is until one comes packaged in with his new Xbox One. Look, I'm already afraid of the Connect. Yeah, or you were afraid of the Connect. The Connect is creepy. <laughs> Before you like if it's sold just it. following you around. Quit looking at me. It it was a bit strange, yeah, to have it tracking you while you weren't using it. Yep. Don't need an eye watching me as I go to the living room in my bathrobe to play a little bit of Mass Effect as I get ready for my day. Please, Sen, that is patently untrue. You would not be wearing a bathrobe on your own. Alright, you might be right. Man, I feel really sorry for whoever inherited my apartment. <laughs> that couch uh, Specifically that be couch. <laughs> but at least they benefited from the part where you duct taped over the horrible floor monsters that damage your feet. Yeah, I still they have, have yet to see if I'm yourself. gonna get charged for those. You moved into this apartment with missing pieces of the linoleum floor. Yeah, we're going to charge you for those when you left. Oh, well, that's why you should have taken pictures beforehand. <laughs> I did. They came out, in fact, like three times to inspect it and decide if they wanted to do repairs. They voted no. Hmm. So which is really, which is really, are are terrible. which is really even more like Scumbag Steve, if you think about it, because that's a unit that's like supposed to be for handicapped people. <laughs> right. Like, that is supposed to be a disabled unit. Likewise, when they came out to fix the giant cracks in the uh, the drywall, mm -hmm. they fixed it on one side of the bedroom, didn't bother even checking the other side. Maybe it's actually compatible with disabled people, because the missing linoleum will really put a big old dent in your foot if you accidentally kick it, but if you're just in a wheelchair, then hey, it's not going to do any damage to your feet. So are you Unless suggesting that blind? my apartment managers and were trying to disable me? So that I would be appropriate for that apartment? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I'm just saying, like, if you were blind instead, that wouldn't help because you'd still feel your feet. Right. Or if you're sin, in which case... that That's uh, more of a mental thing. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> you're just qualified for this department, this apartment by some unspecified disability they just assume you have. Yeah, as I was making my way out of the apartment, uh, I did one of those, oh, hey, congratulations, wait a minute. You totally qualify based on, um, what is this diagnosis of the cray? <laughs> I, I can't really read that. Is being grumpy a disability? I think it is. <laughs> Only if you let it hinder what you're doing. I have also seen both of those movies, so should we start with Iron Man? Sure, we can talk about Iron Man 3. Uh, spoilers. Yep, that's that warning's going in. Okay, so spoiler alert. If um, you haven't seen it by now, your fault. Moving on. Turns just out like that it was like a page-for-page -page adaptation of Extremis, which... Not so much. No. It, it was a combination of Extremis and, and the, five the Five Nightmares. Fears. Yeah, Nightmares. There we go. Which, I keep uh, messing up that name. I don't know. As far as taking Iron Man stories to compile into a motion picture, you, you can do much worse. Indeed. Uh, so, takes place, obviously, after the events of the Avengers. Tony Stark having a nervous breakdown when he realized that well, I just worked with gods and and super soldiers and the, whatever the Hulk is, and I'm just a dude in a suit. Also, wow, the whole you know near, also the whole near death experience thing and the wormhole thing into oh god aliens thing. Right, like having a nervous breakdown seems like an appropriate reaction to that situation in life. I, I do not uh, slight him. But that said, um, yeah, movie picks up. Down the road, Tony Stark going crazier than ever, still trying to just pick his life up and uh, dealing with the idea of, you know, actually having people he cares about. That That's a new experience for him. I like the fact that it starts in a flashback to 1999 
And, like, in the very opening scene, somebody tries to hand Tony Stark a thing, which is one of my favorite running gags in these movies for some reason. He doesn't want to be handed things? You, you, you don't hand things to Tony Stark. That's not how that works. Yeah, that's true. That. They do it in a way where they don't mention it. Like, mm-hmm. it's just somebody's trying to hand him a thing and he doesn't take it, and then they move on. Yeah, the... Uh, his uh, bodyguard, Happy, ends up taking it for him. Which, Happy with a ponytail. John Favre, you're awesome. Yeah, uh, he wasn't actually, taking a whole lot. The person who takes it was uh, Maya. Yeah. Uh, Maya Hansen, who is one of the lead characters from the extremist graphic novel. And who the person is... who was doing the handing um, was Adriage Killian, who is actually the other Eldridge main character Killian, from the graphic novel Extremist. Yes, but the difference being an extremist, he shoots himself in one of the opening scenes, so he's not really in the book. True. So yeah, it is definitely not a page for page. They take the names out of that book. They they mine that book for names, but right. that's basically it. Like, extremist yeah, the, uh, doesn't behave that way. This is this is like a whole bunch of other stuff. But they they, they got the extremist with the, right with the. Um, genetically enhanced with the extremist enhanced soldiers eh, where mm. Tony is fighting them in Washington, D.C. in the graphic novel. It's very similar to the uh, fist fighting combat with the extremist soldiers in the movie. Yeah, they actually do breathe fire. There is definitely a scene in the extremist comic where he chooses to breathe fire. <laughs> I, I figure, no, the, the, that, my problem with that was why did you only do that once? <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that's seriously. kind of what everyone is questioning. Just like, you could breathe fire that could melt metal. Isn't that a great solution to, uh, you know, metal basically soldiers flying at you? Just basically all of your problems could be solved with breathing fire. Um, right. <laughs> um, the the fake villain in this, I guess we have to talk about Sir Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that that's my, my single favorite performance in any Marvel movie. Just right there. Even, even before the big plot twist reveal... When he's doing his I'm an evil terrorist, giving my uh, monologue of fear, that was great. Those were very cool. The videos were well put together. His voice was spectacular. The but- Mandarin is kind of Iron Man's Joker. Like, it's like the dominant villain for that character. Which is weird, because you'd think, dude in a super-powered suit, who's his nemesis? Chinese uh, mystic villain. Wh- Who what? has ten alien rings? Yes. As his super tech. Well, I mean, it kind of makes sense if you think about it thematically, because Iron Man is all like capitalism, and uh, the the Mandarin's obviously like this weird Chinese stereotype. Obviously, China's got those ties to communism. And I was texting Pixie when I was watching the movie, and one of my first text messages was, "I appreciate that the Mandarin is a character that sort of has a long history and was created during the Red Scare, uh, but boy, the name." The Mandarin seems kind of racist. I'm actually just really and I was like, just wait for it; it'll threw. make sense. Did it make uh, sense later? Well, I, I mean, it made sense. Like, I feel that Adrich Killian being the real villain the whole time was kind of well telegraphed, mm-hmm. and that he turned out to be the Mandarin kind of makes it seem more racist. In so far as oh, scary Chinese person whose name is Chinese person. Oh, also, he's a white guy. Except Ben Kingsley is interesting Indian via English. No, but I mean Adrian Killian. Yeah, but even then, anyone who claimed to be the Mandarin in that movie had nothing to do with China. Right. Uh, I think I think it was mentioned, like his character mentioned, like that he had had plastic surgery done for that role. But yeah, it's still the the idea though was that they deliberately created this character, this racist caricature. Because that was what, like, that was the idea of what America wanted to see a terrorist as. Uh huh. That that was the idea. Was this was a caricature of American society's fear. Right. Uh, that that it was a deliberate fabrication just kind of goes. Let's see. Look at you. <laughs> you guys are silly. Yeah. Oh, I. So that I to me seemed like the ben point. Kingsley in this, like his performance as both the Mandarin and as the actual character that he's playing. Uh, I can't remember the the name of the actor, but that was fantastic. His scenes were great. Drunk actor man. Yeah. Everyone did You a just really like great drunk job, actors. Serious compliments in this movie to uh, Gwyneth Paltrow playing Pepper though. 
Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it, she was amazing. Also, I feel like the last 20 minutes or so of this movie could have been retitled Gwyneth Paltrow's Abs. <laughs> <laughs> like, for serious. Like, she doesn't have much of a face going on, but... With her, you take that was, back. Eh, she's... Uh, she has... She's pretty, but she's not the prettiest actress in Hollywood. It, it was essentially Gwyneth Paltrow proves that Iron Man is irrelevant. <laughs> yes. The Iron Pepper just beats the heck out of everything like it's nothing. Like, she finishes the movie proudly. She certainly does. I certainly hope that when yeah, they follow no, up she was on great. it, as they inevitably will, they follow up on it with, um... Tony only having cured the dangerous parts of extremists, such as it killing the user, and not curing the parts where Pepper Potts is just a freaking badass. I think they should keep that part. Alright, so let's start talking plot holes, because we're on a limited schedule today. Um, plot hole one. If you're really concerned for this person's safety, why not just make her her own suit? Indeed. It doesn't seem to be like a big stretch that... You're inventing all of these suits because you can't sleep, because you're worried about this person's safety. Wouldn't just making her her own suit solve all of that? More really? to the point, why did you give out the address where she lives on television? I'm worried about your safety. Oh, by the way, I gave a terrorist her home address. My bad. Uh, oops. Like With respect to the particular scene um, where the gunships are attacking Tony's house and um, the Mark 42 immediately goes on to Pepper to protect her. I feel like the house party protocol should really be Iron Man's first response yeah. in every single situation. Like, right. there's no reason not to bring out every single suit every single time. If you're really concerned about, you know, your own house where you're keeping these things, wouldn't just calling them out of the basement be a lot easier than summoning them across the country? Mm. You leave the Mark 42 on Pepper, and then you wear, like, a Mark 41 or something. That would be fine. Mm -hmm. The Mark 41 actually didn't her. have a working uh, bathroom system, so Tony doesn't wear that one. <laughs> it all just floods into the user compartment. It's, it's a terrible time. Especially with how much he drinks, I mean. <laughs> right. The whole thing just smells like vodka and mangoes. <laughs> Alcohol and you're is weirdly not a significant theme in this story. Yeah, I mean, it you saw like pop. him like set the phone inside the big wine cellar thing, but other than that, it wasn't yeah, highlighted all that much. Yeah, T Tony has a new problem in every movie, and this one it was definitely nervous breakdowns. Mm -hmm. Also, child actors those plague all of Hollywood. I feel like there was an interesting thing to be said about mental health in the situation where. Um, Pepper comes home to the giant bunny that has boobs for some reason that is super weird. And they kind of ignored Tony's mental health. Like, apart from the two panic attacks he has during the movie, like, it's kind of a null point. I feel like the scene where he was having a nightmare and summoned the suit is very interesting. It was very poignant, yeah. I was, I was having a little bit of a rough time with, uh, with the movie at those parts, because it was just like, yeah, that's... No, actually, I don't know, because, like, the parts where he's, like, yelling at the kid at the same time that he's supposedly having an attack, that kind of broke the illusion for me a bit, because it's like, you're ar having an argument. Yeah, like, no, what? This, is, this is a very convenient panic attack you seem to be having, Mr. Stark, because you're still conveying just fine. Yeah, whereas, Sen, you've seen me have a panic attack. <laughs> yes, I, I've seen people with actual post-traumatic stress. They don't communicate very well while in the midst of a panic attack. Well, I guess everybody copes differently and stuff, and we shouldn't be making pre presumptive so judgments, but I thought that was a little... We're saying Tony Stark copes with smarm? Yeah. Smarm directed know. at small children? The thing that I thought was interesting at a relationship level was um, when Pepper comes home and Tony is just staying in the basement and still working, even though she's arrived, because that, that is the only way he can distract himself continuously. And then Pepper forgives him for that. Um, and then immediately afterwards, he has the nightmare and summons the suit. Mm -hmm. And Pepper condemns him and, like, spits in his face um, for his having had that nightmare. And it's interesting to think about how we treat people who have mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Because that probably is not 
a very good way to react in that situation for pragmatic purposes. Like, morally... I didn't you think she was blaming him for having the nightmare more so much as the whole, you know, the suit freaking attacked her. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, you and gotta wonder why he programmed in that feature. Oh. Very legitimate for her to be upset about her safety. But, like, in that moment, probably it doesn't make him any more stable for mm -hmm. him, for her to yell at him. Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't solve anything here and now. Maybe we say all right, we're going to not have these suits around in our private lives. Maybe that's a decision you make, but does does yelling at him actually accomplish anything right here? And I feel like exploring that is in, an interesting aspect of the movie. Mm. Look, um, just be thankful he didn't activate the breakup protocol, in which two of the suits go and throw her car into the ocean, one suit goes and robs a liquor store, and the other one picks up three prostitutes. Like, actually picks them up and brings them back to the house. Pays them well before, I hope. Yeah, uh, we'll pay them afterwards. Half and half. And with respect to Pixie saying that the parts of the um, mental health were having in influence on my mental health in the audience, the part where the kid was just making a lot of noise constantly and the camera angles were really rough did freak me out. And I bet it had that effect on a lot of people. Just the kid would not shut up. It's like, ah, uh, oh, oh, this is... This is grating. Reminding me, well, why you should never allow small children to be leading stars in your movie. Yeah. Also, why would you leave your highly destructive, you know, battle suit that is easily tracked with a small child while you go be the hobo Iron Man? Again, why was not House Party Protocol the first response when the Mark 42 was broken in Tennessee? Why are you not, like, get me some more suits over here? I just want to have a couple on hand. I imagine at the moment those things. suits were buried. Under a whole bunch of rubble. The was destroyed. Yeah, it wasn't mm -hmm. until the construction crew got them out that he could do that. Uh, uh, also, I think really Jarvis was down. very much undestroyed when the house party protocol was activated. Right, like, they just uncovered the hole. spot. Oh, but, um, but Jarvis was incapacitated for a while as well. Sure, but um, nominally Jarvis has is a distributed artificial intelligence, and he was able to convey that message to Pepper through the, well, through the suits. But only when he had enough power. But only when he had enough power. Yeah. So, right, I mean, maybe he It, it took a while, I remember, because there was that the whole field. thing where Pepper was like, you know, everybody was assuming that Tony was dead, and then, you know, it just happened to wander over here and pick up one of these things, and no. Oh. But... Maybe he should have done it from the barn before he made his attack on Trevor Slattery's mansion. Trevor Slattery's mansion. Look, biggest plot hole in the entire movie. You've got all these amazing suits that apparently are no longer powered by your chest because you hooked a battery up to one at one point. Mm -hmm. like, I don't know at what point we stopped using your chest power. Why are you using the one that you've confirmed doesn't work very well for the majority of the film? That is a significant plot hole. You have 41 other models that appear to work just fine. Why aren't you using those? Why are you focusing on Proto Suit? Uh, uh, sort of an anti-plot hole that I want to both be happy about and object to is the part where he gets the shards removed from his heart at the end of the movie, which is great, and I approve of it. You kind of should have gotten the shards removed from your heart like five years ago. That yeah, should that have been was one an of option. the first Wait. things you did. That's what normal people do. You had your band-aid, and now you cast your band-aid aside and actually fix the problem. Wait, wait, you don't wear band-aids after you heal? Why do I have these things all over my arms? Mm. A really cool scene um, was the explanation of the vice president's complicity in the Mandarin plot. Um, which is a scene that took, like, three seconds and contained no dialogue. And it's just a great one addition. shot of the vice president's daughter, who is missing a leg, and the vice president kisses her on the forehead. See, the I vice president like, didn't care at all about her regrowing that leg. He wanted a daughter that could breathe fire. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm misinterpreting that. That seems legit. Yep. You're just like, my kid should breathe fire. Don't care. All kids should breathe fire. 
Really, they shouldn't. Kids are jerks. I don't know if you noticed. Actually, that would be the worst. Like, if the little kid who wouldn't shut up was breathing fire, that would make my panic attack real bad. <laughs> he's making all this noise, and also he's breathing fire. All right, so I feel that's enough Iron Man 3s. Uh, opinions? Good? Yes? Worth seeing? I liked it. it. I don't good. know if I like it more than the other ones. I guess I'd have to rewatch them to be able to make a good comparison. I feel like, emotionally, I might have liked one of the other movies better, but... I feel I, I liked this one more than level. two, but maybe not more than one. Hmm. Still nowhere near the Avengers level of cool. The Stan Lee cameo in Iron Man 3 was way better than the Stan Lee cameo in the Avengers. That was true. Yeah, I'll give you that. That was a good cameo. It worked. Alright, so moving on. Let's talk other geek films. Star Trek, for example. Good franchise. Star Trek? The Star Trek Into Darkness was a Star Trek-ass Star Trek movie. Like, there was no plot trope that usually happens in Star Trek that was left out of this movie. And no reference to the previous films that was not directly done. Kind of yep. disappointed that Uhura didn't really do anything. Nonsense. She shot uh, John Harris in the back, like, 18 times, and he didn't Her notice. Her only relevance was as Spock's girlfriend. That's it. I don't know, I really not liked her considered scene- considered a character in and of herself. I really liked her scene with the Cleons. I thought that was really cool. She was nominally a translator, to no effect whatsoever. Yeah, the Cleons were still just jerks. Even but, when she pandered to, you know, yeah, exactly they only what their society her wants. And it's even thinly veiled that that's, like, in narrative, she was only brought along because she's Spock's girlfriend. It, yeah, it actually did imply that. I mean, yeah, she was a translator, but also, this is a good opportunity for to us to have a relationship fight, even though it's a terrible opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's definitely weaker. Because, like, Curry actually, like, says outright, like, oh, that's not going to be a problem. Like, he's deliberately setting up this drama here for his own amusement, and I don't know, I'm bothered by that. Um, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white lady. Uh, is she from Star Trek, or is she brand new? Uh, the Admiral's daughter. The Admiral's daughter. Brand new. Yeah. Brand new. Mm-hmm. She's just there to be pretty. Anything. Yeah, and complete, to, to, complete throwaway character, by the way. Like, that, that scene in the... She uh, was there because she's pretty. Yeah, the, the scene in the pod where you get to see her in her underwear, like, lady, you claim you don't want him looking, but you're posing. Look at your stance. Was she even wearing a different outfit during the bomb disposal scene? Yes, Planet she was, side? actually. She okay. Had, she had gotten out of the blue, like mechanical team skirt that she was or science team skirt that she was wearing and had put on a black away team outfit uh, okay well if it was if it's actually an away team thing and that has some substance then that makes me feel slightly better about that if yeah. there is an away team garb that people know about she was actually in a different outfit uh bones was in a similar outfit in the same scene mm -hmm. they both changed out of their blues but still like Congrats for adding that scene specifically so that we can show what you look like in your underwear. Yeah. That is so, all that that scene was there for. There was no so the women in So the women in the Star Trek movie don't get a whole lot to do. No, but let's talk about the one who does. Benedict Cumberbatch. I, I was sitting there who staring at woman? Khan for most of the movie, and I was thinking, I know this actor real well, but I can't quite pull the name of this actor out of my head. And then at one point, I was just looking at his face, and I was thinking, that man has a weird face. And as soon as I thought that in those words, it's like, oh, it's Benedict Cumberbatch, obviously. Yeah, that, that moment where he's giving Even his, like, evil speech. Bones. When like, he's so giving his evil hurts. speech in the cell, it's like, dude, you look weird when you're angry. Yep. Cheekbones and mouths don't do that. Benedict Cumberbatch is great, and his con, genetically modified super fist fighting, it reminded me in a great way of Robert Downey, Downey Jr.'s, Jr.'s uh, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes fighting. Uh, yeah. The super scientific, no wasted movement style of fighting. Mm -hmm. it's just real brutal, just beating the crap out of people. It looks like it hurts. A cat has joined our podcast. Hello, cat. Gracie, go away. Oh, right, we have a studio cat again. There's now another studio cat. She's a bit bigger than the last one, but probably a little smarter. So, I am disappointed that the Tribble did not cause trouble. 
There was a Tribble, but there was no Tribble. I, I was so waiting for that, like, pod to be just full of Tribbles and him to be like, What happened? Oh no, it's alive <laughs> again! We had, no, it's like, we had one dead Tribble, and all of a sudden we now have we have 14 billion of them, and they produce methane. <laughs> Like, this should really go bad, because Tribbles have their breeding problem on their own. You just injected a Tribble with super blood. Like, once <laughs> it's alive, it should be an super alive powers. super Tribble. I don't yeah, kind of sad that that didn't pan out like that. That, that would have been a great twist. Yeah. So, was so, looking forward to that. In the original Star Trek, it was Kirk who yelled Khan, right? Yes, in the original version of Wrath of Khan, it is Spock who dies yep, in the Spock. reactor core. And then Kirk who yells, Khan! Yeah, so they, they pulled the switcheroo in the new alt-universe as a way to be all like, eh, eh, we remember that, but this is slightly different! But you know what, I'm okay with it, because you've already set up that the universe is only slightly different based on the events. So, uh -huh. yeah, having those references there... Whatever, it works. People who went to this movie, you're gonna have the people who have no idea what Star Trek is and are just like, I just want to see a sci-fi action movie. They got that. You're gonna have the people who are hardcore Star Trek fans who are like, yeah, we're gonna go see this because it's got the name on it. And I, I would think that they could enjoy it too. Yeah, they do pretty well, in fact. Like, I'd say this sticks really closely to the spirit of actual Star Trek. And that might be a thing that my, this is my least favorite part about it. Yeah. Especially the anti-intellectualism, like this rational versus gut feeling. Like, the word rational means the best thing you can do with the information you have and mm -hmm. your ability to use it. It just means the best thing. Like, it, there cannot be a rational thing that is not the best thing, because those words have the same meaning. But they act like rational is some weird thing in Star Trek and in this movie. I don't understand it. Yeah. I liked all the casual joking at the old series, like the racial slurs against Vulcans. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the Are Your Ears Burning was a funny scene because it's just sort of an idiom we have, and also Kirk was doing the ears jokes in the talking to Admiral Pike mm -hmm. during when they were written up. The, yeah, the racial slurs against space races is great. Space racism is always an interesting thing in fiction because it's a reflection on the real world, but also it doesn't hurt anybody. It's a, it's a fun way to discriminate against people without actually discriminating against anybody. It's like with the, the fighting game scene was all like, being racist is part of our culture. Well, you don't get to be racist against real people. If you want to be racist against fake people, I can, um, I can support that. No, it, it was a sexist thing that you're thinking You're right, of. it was sexism. Although, I suppose you could, like, take any other real ism and apply it to online gaming, because that same justification gets used, but usually it's gender. And people are all like, oh, well, people say horrible things to everybody online, and so therefore you should suck it up and deal with it. The pointy ears jokes are racism made fun. Racism is fine, as long as the actual group doesn't exist. Although, I think there are some unfortunate humans who self-identify as Vulcans. Those poor, poor people. <laughs> are we talking, like, cosmetic surgery to get the pointy ears, or...? I think Somebody I'm just forgot. talking about the same group of people who self-identify as Jedi. Well, I think well, those people are deliberately group. doing it to take the mickey out of it. That those people are just wanting to mess up New Zealand survey results. Yeah. They I want suppose to take the New Zealand thing. census and make it not useful. Mm -hmm. So another way in which this Star Trek movie was very fundamentally Star Trek at heart is the aliens um, in the opening survey scene are like just humans wearing paper mache. Wearing prosthetics. It's like this really well. least effort Star Trek alien style, where all aliens are just humans with the slightest modification. But that's kind of normal of the Star Trek universe, really. Exactly. No, I'm, I'm saying that okay. this is very Star Trek at heart. This is fitting in with the universe very well. And it's kind of dumb, uh, but I guess it's what you want if you want Star Trek. On that note, I kind of like the new artistic style of the uh, Vulcans. Or, sorry, not the Vulcans, the uh, Cleons. Mm. Uh, the Cleons are kind of cool, yeah. They're more than just foreheads, kind of. They have forehead jewelry. 
Oh, it's, it's like kind of, up the bridge of the nose ridge kind of thing. Kind of orcish. Yeah, I, I could see that. It's an interesting costume design, though. Mm-hmm. As a cosplayer, I can get behind that. So what did you all think of the part where Leonard Nimoy is like, I could basically solve all of your problems using time travel knowledge, but I'm not going I to, except for this one. Yeah, that, that was kind of BS. It's like, I swore an oath not to mess with the timeline of this universe by not telling you what's going to happen. That said, let me give you my book I wrote. That said, fuck that, that oath, evil and bastard. I'm totally going to violate the hell out of it. It's fine. But that, that, wait, it, it makes even less sense in the first place because you already messed with the timeline by being here. Yep. The messing has already happened. It's too late to rescind on that. In fact, if you were not messing with the timeline, that already exists. It's called your timeline. You lived it. Ta-da! This is not new to Into Darkness. This is just straight from the original Star Trek movie. Uh, but I do like the excuse for rebooting the universe uh, that keeps the old universe and the new universe in the same canon. Just sort of in different timelines. Especially in like Star Trek, where that's already compatible with the fiction. I think that's sweet. So, yeah. Man, we blew through two movies already. Two movies down. Let's start games. Scribblebots, go! Uh, jeez. Sorry, give me a minute. I had a uh, oral surgery a couple days ago, and my jaw is still in intermittent amounts of pain. So, uh, I played Scribblebots Unlimited, which is not terribly new. Um, in fact, when did this come out? It's an interesting game. Yeah, it came out June 5th, 2012, so yeah, it's almost a year old. And I'd had my eye on it for a while, but I uh, hadn't really done anything about it until just very recently when I had surgery on my face. And then um, I was like, well, I'm going to be stuck at home for a while. So I picked up a game that was simple that I could play to keep me distracted in between bouts of medication. And, um, that's probably way too much information, but there you have it. So, that would be why I blitzed through it as fast as I did. So, you have to collect 120 starites. Well, there's 120 starites that exist, and you yeah. win at 60. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this the, is kind the of game the is over at 60. Model. And then there's just extra stuff if you want to go around doing that. So, for example... What is the basic premise of Scribble Nuts? There is not much of a plot there, if we're being honest. And I suppose there's no reason not to be. Um, you play as Maxwell, who... That is way too loud. Um, gonna turn down all that sound there. And uh, I'm gonna try and see if I can get um, G Plus's screen share to show you this. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. <laughs> Hmm. Don't seem to have an available window for that. Yeah, it's gonna be a DirectX thing, and you could do it if you were running OBS on your side, but not over screen share. Alright, fair enough. Um, so you play as this kid, Maxwell, who has a notebook that, like anything he writes into it, appears. And you can also use this to modify existing items with adjectives. So it's basically type a thing, and then thing shows up. And, like, your only limitations... It's like a death note, but way better. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, your only limitations are no copyrighted material, no profanity, and no proper nouns. And it is pretty wide open. Like, give called up hippogriffs, and it totally works. Um, so you use this to solve various problems or puzzles. The idea is you're going around collecting these little star things uh, under the vague premise of... There's an intro cutscene that's about two minutes long where this highfalutin adventuring couple has like 47 children or something. Was it 42? There are 42 kids, Pyro? Am I right? There are exactly 42. The Douglas number. And, uh, 
Only one of which is a girl, by the way. <laughs> Seems biologically improbable. Yeah, one out of 42. That, that's not right. And guess what happens to the girl? She's a damsel in distress. And does nothing the whole game. Um, yeah, Except so... you get to play as her once you win. But even then, the game still treats you like you're playing as Maxwell, so... It's just a palace swap at that point. You become pink. <laughs> um, and you but... still have a rooster helmet. So, I think the rooster she, helmet Lily, is a Lily silly, funny the girl, thing. and Maxwell, the protagonist, are going to go out on an adventure. They've got this magic notebook and a little globe thing that lets you teleport to different locations, basically. And, um, like, they run into an old beggar dude who is like, hey, can I have some food? And he's all like, hey, I've got this magic notebook. I'm going to write you some food into existence. He, like, gives him a rotten apple because he's being a dick. And <laughs> there's no other reason than to be a dick. And, <laughs> And then the guy was all like, surprise, I'm actually a sorcerer, and that was mean, and therefore I'm going to curse your sister who had nothing to do with this and slowly turn her into stone. And so uh, Maxwell has to go out and do nice things and collect these stars from the happiness energy from people, I guess. I don't know. It's just kind of a very thin thing. Yeah, and... it sounds like just we need a reason for you to be thrown into this map and so you can do things. Um I guess this is nominally like a prequel to uh, Scribble Knots and Super Scribble Knots, which had the plot of I don't know. You can make things, solve these puzzles. <laughs> also, interestingly enough, uh, Jennifer Hale does the narration voiceover as Lily for the opening and closing cutscene. So, kind of neat. So, give us like an example of a puzzle and a crazy thing you did to solve it. Um. There was a prisoner about to be hung, and his... D yeah, this is like, the graphics looks all cutesy and stuff, and the premise is, like, not very complicated, so you'd think kid's game, but it's actually got some pretty dark material in it. Cthulhu makes several appearances. Um, so there's a prisoner, he's about to be executed publicly, you're in, like, a medieval setting, and there's, like, a lady in the crowd being like, please save my friend, but don't kill anyone. So that's your condition, is you have to get him away from the nooses and not cause anyone to die. Interesting. And, uh, cause yeah, like, you can spawn in a shotgun and just go nuts, but... <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this is not a kid's game. There was one point... Okay, I'll, I'll tell that story next, but, um... So for this particular situation, I was like, well, this sounds a lot like the plot to the third Harry Potter book, so I'm going to spawn in a hippogriff, and sure enough, he, the prisoner, and the lady friend get on the hippogriff and fly away. <laughs> Yay! So I did that. Um, There's another one where a vulture is in, like, I can't remember if it's a cavern or a desert or whatever, and the vulture's like... I'm sad because I'm hungry and there's nothing dead around for me to eat. So I type in dead baby and that worked. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the vulture sitting there eating a dead baby. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I conjured no. into existence. Somebody was like uh, one of Maxwell's. There's one of Maxwell's siblings at each level that you unlock by doing a certain task for them as a playable character. It's just it's just like a different skin, basically. But, um, so one of Maxwell's brothers is at every level, and, um, one of them was, like, at a beach, and they're like, we want to play volleyball, but with something that isn't a ball. So, summon in something else. So I just typed head, and so they're just chucking a disembodied head back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I like how all of these stories have been incredibly dark. <laughs> well, that's because you wanted the weird ones. You don't care no, about, that's good. like, the one where it's, like, some, like, villain is sitting in prison going, I need companionship, so I conjure him an evil puppy that's wearing, like, a monocle. And... <laughs> oh, evil puppy. The other thing I like about it is that Maxwell just has the same blank smile facial expression all the time. Regardless so of what's going on. All of them It's just like, like that, Cthulhu yeah. and God are having a fight, and Maxwell's like, that's derp, Oh, derp. that's another really funny story. Ow, I just hit myself. But, um, I was in, like, a haunted house. It's, like, basically based off of The Shining. I'm not even shitting you. There's, like, a whole bunch of references. Like, there's the twins, and, and <laughs> just kind of fucked up. <laughs> and, um... We are swearing a lot in this show. Um, Does the adjective system allow you to conjure red rum that is red? I, di I did try to... That's, that's another thing, is the adjectives kind of don't give a crap about slang. 
So one guy wanted to, one guy on the beach wanted to impress the ladies more. And so I tried to type in like beefy and then he was covered in like beef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a meat man. Yeah. Uh, I was like, oh, well I have to go with muscular. Okay. <laughs> it took well, me way well, too, it takes you way too beefy literally man, and sometimes. Then you turn the ladies into hungry ladies then. <laughs> okay. Um. It was kind of funny. One guy was like, I want to be better at basketball. Adjective, tall, instantly poof cheerleaders. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So I was in a haunted house and there was a priest there. And he, he was like, you know, the fight's a little one-sided. You need to give him something to help with. I don't know. I guess he's trying to help exercise the house or whatever. What you were supposed to do is give him some kind of holy relic, apparently. But I'm like trying rosary. No. It's, apparently the answer was holy water. But like. I was trying to like a bunch of stuff. I summoned God. God immediately starts hitting the priest. I don't know why. He was a very angry <laughs> God. And it was like, you know, old dude, white beard, all that, you know, Sistine Chapel style. And, um, funny enough, Jesus, not available. <laughs> Aww. That's weird, because I thought he was in the previous versions. Yeah, but... In fact, I'm pretty sure you could type that into the previous versions. But Jesus was not available. I tried that. Um... Eventually, I figured out that he needed holy water, but still. <laughs> How often did you encounter puzzles like that that apparently only had one solution? Because, I mean, rescuing the prisoner with the hippogriff is definitely not... Well, that might have been the scripted solution if it was a reference to Harry Potter, but the hope is that there's a million ways to solve all of these. Yeah. Yep. Because, I mean, yeah, like, your very first tutorial thing is clean this pig. And it's like, summon a sponge or a towel or whatever. It's just, like, be all over the place. But some of them, I don't know. Um, some of them, it, it kind of breaks, like, where the NPCs don't notice a thing that you spawn. Like, I, I was trying to, there was a criminal hiding behind a thing in, like, an Old West setting. And so I spawn treasure. And so I get, like, a little gem falls. Like, it was supposed to, like, make him be, like, he's a greedy criminal, he'll, like, jump out and grab it, and then we'll be able to catch him. But, like, he didn't notice, and so I had to do it a couple times, and, like, basically just drop it on his head in order to get him to actually react hey, to the dude, thing. dude, treasure. <laughs> um, I also notice a problem with when, with, uh, just mechanically, with, like, trying to hit the B button to open the backpack versus... And to drag... You can, like, save things in your backpack, like, stuff that you spawn in a lot. Like, for me, it's, like, wings or a jetpack, because I like being able to fly around the level. It gets me around faster. And uh, so I'll just save those in Maxwell's backpack, and then just pull them out when I need them. I always just have them at every level. And uh, if you hit the B button on the keyboard, and then try and drag and drop, the thing won't actually appear. <laughs> like, the right. world will grow go grayscale like it's waiting for you to, like, move the object where you want it to be, but it isn't actually there. You have to actually click the backpack and then drag and drop and then it shows up. So, like, some of the shortcuts don't work. But as far as actual puzzle solutions, I'm trying to think. The Lord of the Rings reference needs one specific thing. There's a volcano where you're in and there's a dude who's pretty obviously supposed to be Frodo. Uh, it's just, like, short, dark hair, wearing a green cape. And he's just standing there going, I was supposed to throw something in here and I don't remember what. It was something round. And that's all you've got to go on. And for a while, I didn't get it. And so I'm just sitting here going, ball head? <laughs> <Just like. laughs> <laughs> Heads worked in this situation before. <laughs> just conjure heads to solve every problem. It's like, um, freaking jelly bean. I don't know, like orange just like i'm thinking of round things to just give him it turns out he needs specifically a ring to uh -huh. throw in and so yeah there's there's some of them where it's like supposed to be a solution to the problem in that puzzle it seems pretty well justified yeah. because like the, that's the whole gag the whole like, gag it, it is, is a joke the one and ring. the joke yeah. is when you figure out what the reference is mm-hmm Sometimes there's like, sometimes it's fun though, because it's like kind of trying to usher you toward, like there's an obvious solution that it tries to usher you towards, and then there's the, I'm just going to be weird and this still technically fits solution. <laughs> like some some guys, um, we need an animal to pull this cart, and you would think you would go with a horse or an ox, unicorn. <laughs> yeah, unicorn. Unicorn will pull the shit out of that cart, but um, 
So yeah, stuff like that. Summon dinosaurs for no reason. It is also possible to... Uh, there's a video on YouTube that's mildly popular and defensive, uh, but it's possible to use glue to attach a fishing pole to someone's head and then food to the other end of the fishing pole, and the people will be like, oh, I want the food, and then the person just runs, and then you can rope them to a cart and you can get the person to pull the cart. That's nice. kind of funny. <laughs> it seems kind of convoluted, but... <laughs> That convoluted solutions are exactly what I want out of Scribble Nuts. This is all so crazy. That, and because yes. copyright things aren't like allowed, and because adjectives are, sometimes I'll catch myself typing "big boss," thinking I'm gonna get like snake, and it's no, it's um going to be a large man in a suit. <laughs> or on uh, PC, there's actually a Steam Workshop that lets you have. Uh, community created things like a Metal Gear Solid big boss, mm -hmm. uh, but it also has a bunch of genericized things that are like this is not violating copyright but it totally is. Um, for example there is a quote test subject that is totally shell from Portal that I think is pretty rad. Mm. Well that's a pretty soon we're going to have the DC Universe scribble knots. That is which, true. Which has every single DC character, like 2,000 of them. Like, you can be specific and be like... Yeah, it was it was very difficult for me to... There, there was like, we need to find somebody who can hunt down these clues, and it's like, my immediate go-to was Batman. But, of course, <laughs> that's not a thing. So it's like, I just had to type in generic detective. <laughs> you have to kind of, like, make it a little less specific to get what you want. Um, you can summon just generic professions, just lawyer, accountant. I was filling I was filling in, that's right, there was one particularly amusing one where it was like, we need a crew for this pirate ship, and so here's somebody to count the money in the treasury. It's like, okay, an accountant. So there's an accountant in the pirate ship. We need somebody to cook the food, and I just typed in mom. <laughs> there's a lady there who's conceivably a mom. So, I hear that on the pirate ship, there was a dude on a laptop. Tell me how you solved that puzzle. Oh, right, um... Because there, there was an internet piracy joke. You had to stop internet piracy. It's so I, you know, I got. I don't remember how I solved that one, but um. You have to if, stop him from solving internet piracy. Would murdering him probably do the job? No, you have to stop him from committing internet piracy. Because he's like sitting there going ah ha ha with his, uh, computer there, and the idea is like the name of the like. Th there's like a different title for the quest. You only get the title once you complete it, kind of thing. Uh -huh. And the title for that one is Not That Kind of Piracy. <laughs> and I uh, can't remember how I solved that one. It's just, I've, I've just been blitzing through this so fast. <laughs> yeah. So you've been having fun with Scribble Nuts? It's been pretty fun. The The story leaves a lot to be desired. I'm kind of mad that the, the Lily character is just totally terrible. And Do any of the brothers have any personality to speak of? They're all just like one thing, kind of. Like... This is the one that's the martial artist, and this is the one who hunts dinosaurs, and this is the one who yeah. So they're they're just like different visual skins, basically. And then there's Maxwell, the one that does everything because he's got a stupid cheat notebook. Yeah, I feel bad for the other brothers and Lily who are like, Hey, why didn't I get omnipotence as a birthday present? Mm -hmm. That would have been sweet, mom and dad. I could have done well with this. Because clearly, no. like, the rest of them aren't as, you know, morally reprehensible. Because, like, Lily gets punished for something Maxwell did, and Maxwell was doing it to be a dick. He's just like, here, have a rotten apple person who can't afford food, while I have the omnipotent power to create a feast and won't. I mean, literally, by writing the word feast here, one would appear, but that's too much work. And, and you know, watching watching you but... suffer biting into this rotten fruit would amuse me. So yeah, and so he's all, and so and so the wizard turns Lily into stone slowly, and you have to like get all the star uh, get sixty star eyes to unlock like free her from the curse. Then turns out wizard shows up and is like, "Psych, I'm your dad the whole time." <laughs> so your dad's a really bad father for every child who is not you. Yeah. Yeah, especially for Lily. Yep. Like, whoops! I just turned you into stone as a gag. To teach Maxwell a lesson, I guess, which you would think you would want him to have learned before giving him the omnipotence thing, because clearly all he's gonna do is run around conjuring dead babies and feeding them to vultures. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Scribble Knot seems awesome, and we will definitely have coverage of Unmasked. Uh, Sen. 
Tell me about Far Cry 3. In the next five minutes, I hope. That's up to you. Okay, uh, if Far you Cry want, 3. we can shelve it. Yeah, we'll do it next week. Okay. Because that'll give me time to finish it. And then I guess that'll probably end this episode. Yay! Yay! Lots of stuff today. We didn't even talk... We, we, did, we have a stream of the Xbox that will be posted at the same time of this episode that you can watch. We'll probably talk about that more in a more formal format at some point, but... There's a new Xbox announced. It's called the Xbox One, which is the worst name. And also, uh, we don't know how much it's going to cost, but it's going to come out sometime this year. Probably holiday season. Woo. All right, so in the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Pyrosim. And you've been listening slash watching to Nerd Talk. Nerd Talk.